again that um, the children's uh, choir will need to be in here uh, to start rehearsing around 10.30 um, for the children's service this morning, which I hope everyone is going to uh, attend. It should be wonderful. Um, but uh, So I'll wrap it up a bit early this week. So I might leave us with a cliffhanger. Uh, if so, come back next week uh, where we will resolve the tensions. Um, all right, so I'll pray for us. Gracious God, we thank you for today. Thank you for setting aside this time for us to study and ponder your word. We pray that you'd be with us um, to help us to consider um, not just the happy and joyful uh, messages of salvation that surely are here, those Easter Sunday proclamations um, that you have defeated death and that you are uh, uh, in the process of and have already saved us. But gracious God, we also are grateful that you tell us the truth that you have sent your prophets and your messengers uh, to tell us honestly about some of the ways that we're living, some of the things that we do, some of the ways that our heart is formed. Uh, we thank you for naming sin. Help us to be receptive uh, to those who you sent to tell us the honest truth and help us to be receptive to your call and to your power and your grace. That gives us the possibility of growing. Amen. All right, so uh, today uh, we continue with our study of the wilderness based in Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness, uh, which is found in three of the four Gospels, uh, this idea of Jesus kind of being cast out into the wilderness. Um, and we'll talk about that next week uh, when we talk about uh, the New Testament and Jesus' um, taking up of this story of the wilderness. Um, so just to recap where we've been, we started on February 25th and we talked about God and the wilderness and how um, most gods in the ancient world, in fact, all major gods of the ancient world did not like the wilderness. Um, they preferred to live in nice places where there was lots of food and water uh, and lots of people to serve them. Um, but we found that in the Bible, Yahweh, the God of Israel, was unusual because Yahweh actually claimed to be more comfortable in a tent wandering around the wilderness spaces. And that Yahweh actually, if Yahweh is said to have a home, where did Yahweh come from? It was the desert regions of Sinai. Um, so this a God who lives in abandoned spaces was quite unusual. And then uh, Cassie uh, Waits led us in uh, a reflection on Hagar in the wilderness uh, in uh, March 3rd and, and focused on the fact that these, um, these ancestors that we find in the Bible, the ancestors of ancient Israel, themselves were desert people. Uh, that is to say, the stories of Abraham and Sarah and the stories of Hagar and her, and her folk, uh, her kin, um, are stories of people who are at home in the desert and find spaces to, to live and exist in the desert um, alongside this story of Yahweh, the God of the desert. Um, but also that we saw uh, in Cassie's presentation on March 3rd um, that the wilderness was actually a space of God's creation. Uh, Genesis 2 begins in a desert wasteland and then God brings water and then God brings life and then God creates it's human life. So that is to say that the wilderness is a space of God's creation and recreation. And we saw that with the story of Hagar, uh, a woman who was cast out uh, from her family, abandoned in the wilderness, and yet God met her there uh, and found water for her and for her family and gave her new life. Uh, we also talked about last week the wilderness and formation or testing was another way to say this. Uh, so that is to say we talked about how ancient Israel has all these stories of the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, um, which are these stories uh, that show up in another way in Jesus's story of his wilderness temptation, those 40 days in the wilderness, echoing that idea of the testing of the people of Israel. Testing, um, we talked about as a, uh, can, can sound really good or bad, depending on if you like taking tests and are good at them or not. Um, but, but for many of us, we have some uh, painful memories of test taking. Um, but what I tried to tell us yesterday was, uh, last week, last Sunday, um, was that these stories of the formation period in the wilderness, after Israel comes out of Egypt, they are formed as a people through these stories of uh, testing is one way to talk about it, but opportunities for growth and for learning and development. Um, so in the same way that, that um, uh, I don't know, exercise tests our body in a way and makes us stronger, uh, these stories were meant to teach uh, ancient Israel about who they really were. So that's the idea of the, the, the wilderness and formation or transformation. We talked about the manna story as one of those places where God gives the people something that they need and asks them to trust, and that trust changes them. This week, we're going to talk about the wilderness and sin and grief. Uh, there's a completely different way of thinking about the wilderness, and that is as a space of um, isolation, a space of 
dealing with sin or being honest about sin. We're going to talk about that, which is not everyone's uh, favorite uh, topic. Uh, this is, you know, something that just kind of comes with like a Surgeon General's label warning, you know, watch out. We're going to talk about some pretty uh, difficult stuff today, that is to say, um, the pain of sin. Um, at the same time, we have to talk about this if we're going to tell the gospel story. Um, the gospel story isn't just a story of salvation, it's a story of salvation from sin. Uh, and so we have to uh, uh, think about this, but also the way that that wilderness that image of the wilderness plays a really crucial role uh, in our story of sin. Uh, it, it happens that this is, uh, uh, you know, St. Patrick's Day. Uh, I'm, I'm very Irish, Brennan breed. I don't know if you could tell, um, but uh, uh, I don't know if any of you have um, ever come across uh, St. Patrick's Day being sort of a temptation to sin. Uh, <laughs> I've certainly seen it myself, uh, but, but nonetheless, it is an uh, opportune time for us to discuss this. Um, but then uh, also the, 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 the issue of salvation, God's grace and salvation, which St. Patrick himself uh, was a great witness to. Uh, and then lastly, wilderness in the Gospels. Next week, we're going to talk about Jesus's 40 days in the wilderness and really think about this story um, and how it works uh, in light of ancient Israel's stories of the wilderness that we've talked about so far, but then also we're going to think about it in light of Jesus's Passion Week. So next week will be Palm Sunday, so we're going to reflect a bit on Palm Sunday itself, but also on Jesus's Passion, Jesus's death on Good Friday, and Jesus's resurrection. And what can we learn about, the, the, about this through the wilderness experience? So just to remind us a little bit about the wilderness, we said in the ancient Near East, wilderness did not mean lots of forests and nice waterfalls. It meant a vast and rugged wasteland, uh, a space that was difficult to traverse, difficult to move around in, a space that lacked water and thus lacked life, uh, was lacking in plants, was lacking in animals, uh, was lacking in humans. There were very few people that lived in these spaces. The people and the animals and the plants that did exist existed on these marginal areas where there was water sometimes and they knew how to get through periods of drought. Thus, there's limited settlement in these areas. Uh, the peoples that did live there moved around. The animals that lived there, they moved around too, finding sources of water that were temporary and could give them life. And so all of these spaces lacked borders no one was trying to own these spaces or control these spaces, which made them possible for people to live in who wanted to run away from structure and borders and powers, uh, including ancient Israel. When they left Egypt, they went out into the wilderness instead of going, last week we said, instead of going by the land route uh, that went along the ocean, that kind of by the Gaza Strip, that would have been a place where that would have been easy to survive. There would have been lots of water all along that coastland. But there were also strong rulers and leaders that would have recaptured ancient Israel. So this was the reason that they get led out into the wilderness, because they weren't strong enough yet. They had spent 400 years in slavery. They were just liberated as a people. They did not really know this God who had liberated them very well. They, did not, they were not formed yet to be the kind of people who trusted this God. And so this year, this, this experience in the wilderness, as we saw in Exodus, was meant to really form them to people who trusted Yahweh, trusted their God. So then, the, the wilderness is also seen as this land of chaos, especially by people like Pharaoh. Pharaoh looks at the wilderness and says, that's a land of chaos. Any gods out there are chaos gods. Any gods that live out there are chaos monsters, in fact, like Seth or Set, who was the god of the wilderness spaces in ancient Egypt. And if you've ever heard the ancient uh, um, myths of ancient Egypt, uh, these are myths of Set uh, or Seth trying to kill Osiris and trying to kill Horus, trying to kill Isis, these gods of order and structure who are associated with the major cities of ancient Egypt. So these wilderness gods are fighting against the gods of order and structure and the gods who support Pharaoh. So if you're Pharaoh and you hear a story about a desert god named Yahweh who works with the enslaved people who's trying to destroy your power, you think you're fighting against a demon. This is how Pharaoh would have understood Yahweh. And not only Pharaoh, this is how many of the peoples of ancient Canaan, of the ancient Near East more broadly, would have understood Yahweh. If you explain that you worship a God who lives in the wilderness, who likes to destroy cities <laughs> and destroy Pharaoh in order to liberate enslaved peoples, you were talking about a demon who was trying to overturn the order and structure of the world. Enslaved peoples and poor farmers were understood to be necessary to the order and structure of life in the ancient world. 
Pharaoh would have told you, if you would have told Pharaoh, I'm poor, I think this is a bad thing, my life should be better, Pharaoh would say, no, (laughs) your life should not be better because in order for me to be Pharaoh and me to live in a nice palace and for the gods to be fed, right, you need to have almost nothing. That's the way that this works. There was no a sense of like uh, growing the pie in the ancient world so everyone could have a bigger share of huge technological innovations were not on the table. Uh, that is to say, if you wanted to have people in your society who had a lot, you had to have many more people who had almost nothing. So this idea of poor enslaved peoples being liberated and then, according to Yahweh's law, sharing all of the land together instead of Pharaoh owning it all, that meant that you could not support this major class of kings and nobles. So you then were worshiping a god of chaos, a demon, who was trying to undo the order of the world. This is how the Canaanites would have seen the Israelites and their god. This is how the Egyptians would have seen the Israelites and their god. This is how the Babylonians would have understood the situation. So in the ancient world, they had pantheons of gods, all these gods. You would have worshiped lots of gods in the ancient world. There's only one god of the peoples of the ancient Near East that we can't find in anyone else's pantheon. Egypt borrowed the god, the storm gods of ancient Canaan and put them in their pantheon. Uh, The the Canaanites borrowed the gods of ancient Mesopotamia and put them in in their pantheons. The Mesopotamians borrowed the gods of the ancient Canaanites as well. They all shared gods, except Yahweh. That's the one god we can't find in anyone else's pantheon. Yahweh was a leper god a God that was rejected by all of the other peoples precisely because Yahweh was seen as a demon. Yahweh was seen as something that was a threat to order and structure. And that's because Yahweh was a God of the wilderness who liked wilderness people. So this was in opposition to Pharaoh and order and power. And as we read in the Old Testament, Yahweh, the God of Israel, delivers the people of Israel, and then they form a kingdom. And Yahweh tries to remind them over and over again, you're supposed to be a kingdom that's unlike any other kingdom. Your kings are not supposed to act like other kings. In fact, Yahweh gets really upset when the ancient Israelite people say, we'd like a king. And Yahweh sends a prophet, Samuel, who tells the people in 1 Samuel 8 through 12, over and over again, this is going to ruin your life. You're going to hate this. I, Yahweh says, I am your king, but then I want you all to actually act as brothers and sisters to each other. You're supposed to be siblings to each other. If you make a king, that person's going to take and take and take from you and recreate the structure of Pharaoh. And if you do that, then I'm going to have to uncreate the structure that this person has built, just like Pharaoh, because I'm a God who desires a community of people who treat each other as equal. This is what God says over and over again. So over time, ancient Israel faces a serious problem. Like we talked about last time though, what God does to agents of oppression and chaos and disorder like Pharaoh, although Pharaoh thinks he's a God of order, God sees Pharaoh as an agent of chaos. Chaos because Pharaoh is building an order and a structure that tears apart the fabric of our shared human identity. Tears apart our fabric of our shared community. And because of this, Yahweh tells Pharaoh over and over again, you have to let my people go. And when he finally says no for the hundredth time, Yahweh ends up saying, okay, I'm going to destroy you and your army then in order to liberate the people. And this is the story of that Red Sea crossing. God uses, Yahweh uses the sea, the, 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 the giant river or body of water. We don't know what body of water this is. The Red Sea is a historical thing that started in the Middle Ages. But Yahweh uses the waters to destroy Pharaoh's armies. The waters in the ancient world were understood to be a symbol of the chaos monsters. The chaos monsters of the ancient world were symbolized as the oceans, the seas. Yam, which is the word for sea or ocean in ancient Israel, was the name of the chaos monster in Canaanite creation mythologies. Uh, The sea monster Tiamat was the evil monster in Babylonian creation stories that the gods of the cities had to fight and subdue in order to create order and structure. But Yahweh uses these forces that are understood to be forces of chaos, the waters, to overcome Pharaoh, to overturn the structure and the order. So then we talked about last week that God brings the Israelites into the wilderness 
right, in order to form them as a new people and tests them. We'll come back to this next week with Jesus. And we talked about how in the wilderness we have to trust. We have to trust that there is someone who can bring us food and water. Uh, and that was Yahweh bringing the manna and bringing water from the rock. And it, this reliance, this trust can bring gratitude, can form in us gratitude and can demonstrate for us God's grace. There are tangible ways for us to see God's grace. And we talked about how the wilderness spaces that some of us might be in at certain points of our lives, uh, spaces where we don't have what we think we should have or what we need. Um, those can be very difficult and often are. Those can be, not always, but can be spaces where we have to learn to trust, to trust God and how God works through other people and through some of the lack even in our own lives where we have to depend upon God and not ourselves. And that can lead to times of transformation. So now we're going to move to a different image of the wilderness. When Jesus goes out into the wilderness, there is some testing or temptation. That word temptation, the Greek word, we'll talk about this next week, it's translated as temptation in the stories in the wilderness, uh, in, in the Gospels. Um, that word really does mean more something like testing. I mean, I can't, I, tempting means something evil, like I'm going to tempt you to evil. Um, but this, these are stories about Jesus being tested in a way before he starts his ministry. But all to say that testing, we see that. But we also see when Jesus goes out in the wilderness, he does run into demons. He runs into evil spirits. He runs into Satan, uh, according to the Gospels, um, which we'll talk about next week is not actually a name. It's a title. But we'll get to that later. But for now, just notice that Jesus goes out in the wilderness and he runs into bad things, bad spirits. Ancient Israel talked about this too. Uh, remember, we talked about Yahweh lives out there in the wilderness. And the wilderness was associated with evil spirits. It was associated with bad things. Well, in ancient Israel, they said, yeah, God lives out there in the wilderness. But they also said, yeah, the wilderness is a spooky place. It's strange. It's full of jackals and hyenas and uh, this kind of unpredictable uh, nature of the world that is associated with death and is associated with uh, isolation and, and, and people wandering away from the path. And so one of the images that's used again and again, again and again in the Old Testament and in the New to talk about the wilderness is sin. So we talked about testing or temptation. We've talked about creation and recreation, but now we're going to talk about sin. It's a very different image that's used in the Old Testament to talk about the wilderness. Now that word sin uh, is an English word, but it's translating a Hebrew word. And that English word sin does mean to miss a mark. Like the archer sinned really means the archer, the person shooting arrows, did not hit the target. And this is an accurate translation of the ancient Hebrew word chatat. Uh, chatat in Hebrew means to miss, to miss something. Uh, it's used metaphorically to talk about sin. And we know this because there's a story in the book of Judges. There's other stories too, but there's one story in the book of Judges um, where the, there are, uh, this one tribe, the Benjaminites, I'm using my right hand, I should use my left because they're left-handed. Um, they, they sling, they have, they're really good at slinging, and it says that they never chatated, they never missed their mark. That is to say, this word really is about hitting a target or missing a target. And it's also used when people get lost. It doesn't mean they sinned necessarily. It means like you got lost on your way. You veered off the path. You missed your mark. You missed your destination. You missed your landmark. And so now you're out. And it's associated then with the wilderness or with dangerous spaces of travel simply because it means that you've wandered out into some place where they can't support you, that you don't, you don't know who lives here, you don't know what, like, so this guy lost here in the Sahara Desert, that's a big problem, right? We start to worry for this guy. Um, and the, the, the point here is that sin is this way of talking about people who have wandered astray or who have missed the mark in some way. There's other, these, these I think this, this kind of metaphor of losing the way, missing the mark, um, Another way of saying this is that you've veered apart in your relationships. You've missed some way in the connections that are supposed to sustain your life. And this is really the core of what ancient Israel and uh, early Christianity talks about when they talk about sin. It's a problem really of relationships. Today we might talk about things like drinking too much or sexual stuff or you know uh, whatever, but cheat, you know, just stealing money. Um, really the core of sin, it, as ancient Israel sees it, uh, those are all like symptoms of like a deeper problem. Like if you rip off everyone that you know all the time, the problem isn't that you're ripping people off all the time. The problem is that you don't have a sense of connection or relationship with these other people in your life. 
You don't see them as real people if you treat them this way. Um, so the real deep problem is a problem of disconnected relationships or broken relationships. And there's a horizontal dimension of that, that we treat the other people that we live with in ways that show that we actually don't have relationships with them. We break our trust and our relationships with our neighbors and then we live in these kind of disconnected, broken ways. But then also there's a vertical dimension between us and God as a community, but also as individuals, that we break our relationships with God and continue to live in these broken ways. And we can use sin in, in a way, um, I don't know if you walk around in the, on the square in Marietta and talk about sin a lot and point fingers at people. I mean, you know, that's not going to make anyone listen to you anymore. <laughs> They're just going to walk by and shut their ears and it's going to not work at all. But if you talk to people about brokenness in their lives and ask them um, about places where they sense brokenness in the world and in their lives, um, everyone feels this and everyone knows it. Everyone alive today knows and deeply feels that there is brokenness that's a part of this world. And we all carry with us a sense that it, this isn't the way it's supposed to be, that it should be better, that this is wrong. And sometimes we get frustrated or upset and even upset at God. And sometimes people even lose faith in God because they're so upset about the fact that brokenness exists in the world and it shouldn't. This is what sin really is and what it's really about. And if we look at the Bible to tell us about this, we can look at Genesis 1 as the creation story where God creates the world, creates everything, says it's good, creates humanity, and says, I have created humans in my image. So every single human that has been created, every single human you've ever met and you ever will meet, was created fully in the image of God and bears, in a way, this image of God, this impression of God within them. And if there's one thing we know about God, it's that God is relational. God loves to have relationships with people. And God, even as in the Christian depiction of the Trinity, God is a relationship at heart. God is three in one. God is an internal relationship. And God created the world so that God could be in relationship. God wants to have community. And yet, we all know the next part of the story, right? God created us to be in relationship with each other and with God, to model this image of relationship that God is as a part of God's being, and yet humans go astray. And the way we go astray in the stories of Genesis 3 is that we break trust in relationship with God. We start to lie to God about stuff. We start to do stuff that God has asked us not to do, right? God creates these boundaries. Don't do this. And then the humans, of course, do this. Uh, and then the humans hide. The humans lie to one another. The humans, uh, you know, get in some conflict. And then, of course, afterwards, we see in Genesis 4, the story of Cain and Abel. Humans start to kill each other, hurt each other, harm each other uh, in order to acquire more or because of jealousy or because of anger, strife. And we see that this, this core of sin really is this indelible part of the human experience. All humanity experiences this. And this is the claim of both Old Testament and New. So what does God do about this? Well, we actually got the flood story, right? God floods the world to get rid of the bad people in Genesis 6 through 9. God floods the world to get rid of bad people. And then afterwards, people aren't bad anymore, right? No, right, we're, we're still bad. What is the first thing Noah does? He gets drunk, right? Uh, so, uh, and then his kids get in a fight over something that's pretty obscure, to be honest. We don't really understand that story, but his kids get in a fight and then curse each other. God's curse them. Do you, that is to say, everything gets messed up right after this story. We can actually see that the flood story is not about fixing this problem. God says, I'm gonna, I, God says, I want to fix the problem of the human heart in Genesis 6 by getting rid of all the bad people. And then in Genesis 8, God, after the flood, God says, actually, you know what? Uh, that doesn't fix the human heart. The human heart's always problematic. You can't just get rid of the bad people and fix the situation. I don't know that there have been churches who have tried to go through uh, splits in some way, right? To get rid of the bad people. And then you realize, oh no, uh, we're all the bad people, right? We're, we're all in the bad place, right? You know, that is to say, like, we, we, we all have this bad stuff in us. You can't just get rid of certain bad people and then everything's going to be great all the time. Uh, as Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Russian, great Russian uh, author, has written, uh, the line between good and evil doesn't run between different people. It runs through the middle of every human heart. So the flood story, I think, is there to really tell us that you can't solve the problem of evil by getting rid of certain groups of people. At the end of the flood story, God says, I now know that the human heart will always be evil. 
So then there's a new pattern. There's a new approach. There's a new plan that God puts on the table. And that new plan is really found in Genesis 12. In Genesis 1 through 11, God tries to fix the whole world, everything all at once. The Noah story, the Tower of Babel story, and it doesn't work. You can't fix all the people at once. So God picks one family, this one little family, the family of Abraham and Sarah, and God says, I want to fix the whole world through you. In Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, God says, go from your family and go from your place of living and go from your kin and go to a land that I'm going to show you later so that I can bless all of the peoples of the earth through you. So God, God says, if there are people who want to curse you or who want to kill you, I'm going, to, I'm going to protect you in a way. I'll protect you from people who try to hurt you. But the whole purpose at the end of Genesis 12, verse 3, the whole purpose is so that all the peoples in the world may be blessed through you. So God's going to fix, pick one little family with all their problems. God's going to accept that they're going to have problems. And God's going to work with them slowly over a long period of time to try to form them into the kind of people who are going to end up reconciling all of the nations to each other and to God. That's the plan. And that's Genesis 12 all the way through Revelation 21. Thinking of the Bible as Old Testament, New Testament is actually, I think, uh, a bit less helpful than thinking about it as Genesis 1 through 11, and then Genesis 12 all the way to Revelation 21. This is the new plan to try to work through this family. And there's a major moment after God delivers the people of Israel right up to the edge of Sinai. They're in the wilderness. They're at, they're at God's home. This is Exodus 19. God brings the people to God's home out there right in this very same mountain that Moses had run into all those years ago. And God brings them to the foot of Sinai and it says in Exodus 19, on the third new moon after the Israelites had gone out, so three months after they had left, on that very day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. They had journeyed from Rephidim and camped and entered the wilderness of Sinai, and they camped there in front of the mountain. And then Moses went up to God, and Yahweh called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, This is the whole reason God brought them there. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. That's salvation. God has saved them from Pharaoh. And it was from grace alone. God saved them, and there was no reason for God to save them, except for God's plan for the world. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant... You shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. So now God's going to give them a covenant, which means a deal. God's going to make a deal with them, a contract. And the point of the contract is so that they can be a priestly nation. Verse 6, if you do this, indeed, God says, the whole earth is mine. God loves the whole earth, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. God, God picks these people to form them through this covenant, through this relationship, to become the kind of people who are going to be priestly to all the peoples of the world. They're going to be the people to mediate God's love and blessing, and also to talk honestly about sin to all the peoples of the world, and eventually reconcile all of the world to God. This is the plan. This is the purpose of God bringing them out. It's to transform them into the people who can reconcile. And yet, we have heard again and again that this is not all that happened. Uh, that the kingdom turns astray. First of all, they want a king, they get a king, and the king ends up looking a lot like Pharaoh over and over. And God sends the prophets to remind the people of this plan and this covenant. And the prophet Jeremiah is someone who lived right before the exile, the destruction of Jerusalem. And Jeremiah said over and over again, God is telling us that we have turned into Egypt and we are oppressing many peoples in our own kingdom, but outside our kingdom too. And this has got to stop for the same reason that Pharaoh's oppression had to stop. And again and again, God reminds them. Jeremiah chapter 7, Jeremiah stands before the temple. And Jeremiah says, do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of Yahweh. So in other words, the people in Jerusalem said, hey, we got the temple of Yahweh here. Yahweh works for us. So we get to do whatever we want. It's like a get out of jail free card. So let's conquer those people. Let's Let's, yeah, let's oppress our poor. But yeah, yeah, let's, let's take what we want. I mean, we're kings and we have, we have God living in our backyard. This is awesome. Then Jeremiah says, if you truly amend your ways and your doings, and then he says what that means. If you truly act justly with one another, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you don't go after other gods to your own hurt, then I will dwell with you in this place, in this land that I gave to you. 
But, verse 8, here you are, trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Are you going to steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to other gods that you have not known? Does that sound familiar, that list? Commit, steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely. Yeah, this is the Ten Commandments. He's like, you've read the Ten Commandments, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, but you're going to hurt innocent people like the alien, the orphan, the widow. You're going to oppress vulnerable people? Then you're Pharaoh. And then what else am I going to do? And then he says, are you going to do all this stuff? And then verse 10, are you going to do all that bad stuff and then come and stand before me in this house of prayer in the temple, which is called by my name, Yahweh's temple, and say, we are safe only to go on doing all these abominations? Like, in other words, you're going to think that I'm going to protect you just because of, your, of who, like who you are? You're, you're, a, you're a particular group of people that I like? You, you think I'm doing this just to help? Like, protect you or something? Like I'm your guardian angel? No, I, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to get you to become the kind of people who are going to not only help the orphan, the widow, the people, but create these bonds of community between yourself and between God and the world and then radiate out from that, right? That's what God's trying to do. So are you going to do all this stuff and then stand in the temple and say, we are safe only to go on doing all these things? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a, a den of robbers in your sight? Y'all, has this house, which is being called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? Anyone, that, that, your ears tingle a little bit, you hear that? That's what Jesus said when he came in on Holy Week and flipped over the temple tables, right? The tables of the money changers, right? Jesus was quoting Jeremiah right here. So we'll come back to that next week. But Jeremiah himself talks about this deformation of the people as really this uncreation of sin, what sin really does is it decreates relationships. And Jeremiah talks about this uncreation, decreation that ancient Israel went through by being formed as a people who would love each other and love their God and then teach this to the nations and then oppressing and hurting the very vulnerable among them as a matter of course and you know, turning into Pharaoh. So in chapter four of Jeremiah, verse 24, 23, Jeremiah says he looks out and he sees the earth and lo, it was waste and void. And these are the words that begin Genesis 1. Tohu vavohu, welter and waste. It's chaos. The world has returned to chaos and to the heavens, but they had no light. This is like Genesis, like before creation. The world got uncreated. I looked on the mountains and they were quaking and the hills moved to and fro. And I looked and there was no one at all and the birds of the air had fled. I looked and look, the fruitful land was a desert and all its cities were laid in ruins before Yahweh and before God's fierce anger. Now, we look at the Old Testament and we say this is an angry God who's really mad all the time and just grumpy. But the New Testament God is very happy. Well, we just talked about Jesus flipping over tables in the temple. <laughs> Remember, he makes a whip out of cords and starts hitting people, right? The New Testament God isn't just all rainbows and, and cotton candy, right? Um, the Old Testament God also gets angry like Jesus does for certain reasons. The God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are the same God and they get mad for the same reasons. The God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament both get mad. That is God. There's only one God. That same God of the both Testaments gets mad because people are hurting vulnerable people. That's the core reason. That's really the primary core thing. Remember what Jeremiah says, number one on his list of bad things, you're oppressing the orphan and the widow and the poor. You, you are hurting vulnerable people, which is like the worst. And why did Yahweh save ancient Israel? Because they were enslaved. They were the poor. <laughs> they were the people who were being oppressed. They were the vulnerable ones. God saves vulnerable people and God cares about them. This is the mark, the core mark, because you love your neighbor, right? Who like is just like you and you might love like your kin who are just like you. But when you show the love of God, that's when you love people who don't deserve your love according to any standard of the day. People who can't give you anything, right? This is, this is the love of God. So all to say that Jeremiah looks and says, this world has been uncreated through sin. I looked and the fruitful land was a desert and God was angry. God is angry not because God just happens to get angry all the time. God gets angry because certain, like, just like I would get angry if someone tried to hurt my kids. I get angry. Some vulnerable people who are in my care if other people try to hurt them, I get mad. <laughs> I, if I said, oh, that's great, that's wonderful, right? I'd be a cruel father. In the same way, God is mad about certain things that have happened in this world. And then, for thus says the Lord, verse 27, the whole land shall be a desolation. Now, the world became a desolation because of the acts of these people, but God says it will be a desolation. Yet, God says, I will not make a full end. Because of this, the earth shall mourn, the heavens shall grow black, but I have spoken, I have purposed, I will 
not relent and I will not turn back. God's going to allow sin to work for a while. And this is going to create some desolation. But God says it will not be an end. I will not make a full end. God's going to make a recreation soon. So the wilderness was this space of kind of decreation, uncreation, and isolation and loneliness. If you ended up out there because you made a wrong turn, you felt alone. And this image of the wilderness is this image that tells us about sin. This is what it feels like to be alone. All, I mean, some, you know, we've, we've all known people, maybe some of us have lived this ourselves, where people make a lot of uh, selfish choices and then they realize one day, I'm by myself now. I feel utterly alone. And this is what we're told is the condition of sin, feeling utterly alone. Well, ancient Israel was uncreated, was decreated. The elite were taken into exile in Babylon. Not everyone, right? A lot of the poor farmers got to stay in the land. And actually some of the poor farmers said, we really lament and mourn the destruction of Jerusalem and, and the temple where we worshiped, but now we don't have local kings taking all of our money. We do have some records of some local people saying, actually, it was a little bit better after, after Jerusalem was destroyed. So that is to say that the, the folks in Jerusalem were taken away into exile and God tries to reform them and reshape them in their place of exile in Babylon. And during that time, they, some of them thought God has abandoned us in this wilderness of Babylon. That is to say, Babylon was a big city and it was a heavily populated area, but they felt like they were in the wilderness precisely because they were away from everything that they knew, everything that they loved, everything that made their life make sense. Their temple was gone, their king was gone, their city was gone, and now they were living among peoples that had hated and destroyed them. They felt like they were alone and in the wilderness, and they asked questions like, is Yahweh here among us? Can Yahweh come this far away? Does God still love us? Does God actually care for us? If God wanted to take us back, would we, would we even say yes? That's to say, there were live questions for those people who were deported into the exile into what they felt like was a wilderness. And in that space, the prophets spoke back. I won't read the whole thing for you here, but Ezekiel chapter one, that wheels within wheels thing, Ezekiel is standing by a canal of the Euphrates River outside of a city called Nippur. This is that image of Nippur, this uh, city that Ezekiel stood by. He was standing outside of Nippur by this canal, and he had a vision of wheels within wheels. What he's really seeing there is the Ark of the Covenant, but the Ark of the Covenant that now can fly and has wheels. It's not just carried by people anymore. Long time ago, before Ezekiel, they had the Ark of the Covenant. They walked around, and it was the mobile presence of God that walked around in the wilderness with them. All those 40 years in the wilderness, God was carried, they, they thought, on this mobile ark. The ark actually was a throne. It was a throne that moved around, the mobile throne of God. And God was understood to be like, un invisibly present upon that ark. And so they would bring the ark and put it in the Holy of Holy of Holies at night when they set up that tent, that little tabernacle. And then when Solomon built the nice temple in Jerusalem, he took that ark and he parked it in the Holy of Holies. And that's the last we hear about it, 1 Kings 8. There's lots of stories about what happened, like kind of uh, folk tales about what happened with, the, t with the, 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 uh, the Ark of the Covenant after that, but there's nothing in the Bible about it after that. But what Ezekiel does is he has a vision of this mobile presence of God from their ancient past. This is from 500 years before Ezekiel's time. No one had seen it in 500 years. And Ezekiel has a vision of this mobile presence of God busting out of the temple and flying in the wilderness and coming to see the people and be with them. It's about God being present wherever we are, whenever we are. The message here is you are actually never alone. Even in the midst of what feels like your most isolating experiences, that time when you felt like there was no one who understood, no one who knew, no one who cared. The book of Lamentations is all about it. the city of Jerusalem personified as a woman who has been hurt badly. And the cry that happens again and again in the book of Lamentations is there's no one who sees, there's no one who cares, there's no one who's, who comforts me. This is repeated five times in the first chapter of Lamentations. No one sees, no one cares, no one comforts. No one sees, no one cares, no one comforts. This is what sin feels like, that ultimate isolating experience. And yet, Ezekiel says, God has always been with you and will always be with you. Now, between Babylon and Judah is a wilderness area. So people would not travel across 
in a straight line between Jerusalem and Babylon. They'd have to go all the way up to the, uh, up the Euphrates River to the seacoast and then come down the seacoast, a much longer route, because it was wilderness space. You couldn't live there. There was no road that went straight from Babylon over to Judah, except what we do here, and we'll talk about this um, more next week, is that there was a metaphorical road. Isaiah chapter 40 is written for these people who felt that there was no one who saw and there was no one who comforted. And chapter 40 of Isaiah says, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term. Her penalty is paid. She has received from the Lord's hand double all her sins. We can get to that later. But a voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. So the voice isn't crying out in the wilderness in Isaiah 40. It's the voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare a way of the Lord, a road. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley is going to be lifted up, and every mountain shall be made low, and the uneven ground shall become level. This is going to be a nice highway, a straight and fast road. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is about a road going straight through the wilderness to bring them home that God has been through this desert season preparing a way to return this people to a life that they understood. And we can see that uh, uh, throughout the book of Isaiah, uh, this is understood as the restoring of wilderness spaces. This is where I'll end. Sorry, I'm a couple minutes over, but I'll end here. Uh, This is an image, one of these beautiful images from Isaiah chapters 40 through 55, which are all about this returning of the people through the wilderness to a place of comfort and of, uh, of, of a rest of restored relationship with God and with neighbor. So uh, chapter 41 of Isaiah, verse 17. When the poor and needy seek water and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, Yahweh, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry lands will become springs of water. I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive. I'll set the cypress in the desert, the plain and the pine together, so that all may see and know, all may consider and understand that the hand of Yahweh has done this, the Holy One of Israel has created it, or recreated it. This idea of the wilderness springing spouts of water uh, and, and bringing tons of uh, fecundity and life once again. Uh, this is an image of salvation. Salvation that we'll talk about next week. I'll see y'all then. I'll stick around for questions and answer time. And uh, please be with us for the, for the children's choir that'll start in a little bit.